showtime. Tom does not want to be obvious. <laughs> and that's what lures us into his music. It's not simple. It's not complete. There's room for us to get lost in it. Wasted and wounded. what the moon When he sings, he goes into that completely monstrous demon voice, like he's possessed. Nobody writes in so many characters so effectively and gets away with it. Can I get a hallelujah? I'm going straight up to the top. And somehow he puts all that under the banner Tom Waits. How does a guy with a voice like that decide to be a singer and succeed? Well, it was a choice between entertainment and a career in air conditioning and refrigeration. <laughs> I was just so impressed with his, you know, stage persona. Because that's what it was, really. How much of that is real? I don't know. They say that I have no hits and I'm difficult to work with. And they say that like it's a bad thing. It's experimental music in the context of pop music. I think I'm drawn as much to melody as I am to uh, dissonance. You know? I'm always trying to cross the wires a little bit. philosophies about writing yeah never sleep with a girl named Ruby and never play pool with a guy named Fats <laughs> <laughs> well, I was born at a very young age and uh, I was born in a backseat of a yellow cab in Murphy Hospital parking lot and uh, it was kind of a thunderbird moon uh, that crawled across a muscatel sky there so uh, I decided what I was going to do very young. My father is a teacher, and uh, my mother is also a teacher. They split up when I was about 10 years old, and then I was kind of became the man of the family, you know? When I was 14, I started working. When I left home, I got in. You know, I got in a little trouble, staying out after dark a lot. You know. yeah. What doing? Huh? What doing? Oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to California. He's an extraordinary painter of pictures, as well as a teller of stories. He's very focused on, on Los Angeles. That's the kind of city that he is trying to make sense of. On the one hand, you could listen to it, and it sounds like a guy talking about, hey, it's Saturday night, let's go out and find some fun, you know, kind of thing. But then as Tom Waits always manages to so brilliantly to do, you know, he's uncovering other layers there. There is a romance to it, and 
You don't know with Tom exactly whether it's the night he has the romance with or whether it's a pretty girl. You know, you just don't know with Tom. You're looking for the heart of Saturday night. Tell me, is it the crack of the pool balls? Neon buzzing. Loneliness hits so much at the heart of so much of his music, I think. It's just a longing for something and being alone and how do you live with that and how do you deal with it? Magic or the melancholy tearing your eyes. I think Waits is a poet of doomed LA no hopers. People who are almost like characters from a noir novel. They're getting their last chance at love. You're stumbling onto the heart of Saturday night. I mean, everybody needs a different climate in order to create. Mine usually comes in, uh, if I'm talking with somebody in a bar or something, I uh, get a couple of loggers and uh, try to stretch out in conversation. I try to open things up and then uh, I try to remember it all later and then I write it down. We got in a taxi and he started talking to the taxi driver right away, like he was his next door neighbor or something. And by the time we got out of the taxi, he knew all about the guy. Whatever was in the street, Tom scooped it up and made something out of it. We all fancied ourselves as these characters that Tom was conjuring. Well, who isn't looking for cinematic romance in their everyday lives? There's a, a, a real romance to hanging around these places. It's where you go to meet girls, but it's also where you go to invent yourself in strangers' eyes. His right hand which saith, Come on, boy, go thou across the ground. Go moan for man. Go moan. Go groan. Go groan alone. Go roll your bones alone. Go thou and be little beneath my sight. Go thou and be my new to seed in the pod. Go thou, go thou, die hence. And of this world report you well and truly. Yeah. Well, I've been asked to, uh, about Jack Kerouac here. Um, I, I guess I started reading Jack Kerouac when I was still in high school. And um, so I guess that's over 10 years ago. And um, I think he understood the same things that Kerouac and writers of his generation were talking about. I see Tom Waits as being able to visit that. So I guess I uh, will always uh, uh, owe a debt to Jack Kerouac for finally uh, opening my eyes um, and making me feel like it's all right to sleep till four in the afternoon and go out all night and, and uh, take a good hard look at the underbelly of the bowels of a major urban center. Tom loved tenor saxophones. That was the sound of loneliness and that was the sound of love. I think that's one of the things that drew us together was that I had made a lot of jazz records and improvisation was very much the meat of those things. We talked a lot about that kind of music where it's just comes right out from your gut. It's all about the kind of cat that would sell you a rat's asshole for a wedding ring. And all you had to do was bend the right over and step right over. Step right over, step right over. Step Right Up is kind of a Kerouac-esque stream of consciousness in the way that Kerouac wrote on the typewriter. He had a huge reel of paper, so he could just continue throughout the night, and whatever came out of his head made it onto the paper. You could tell he's written it quite spontaneously, having fun with the idea of a carpetbagger. 
a door to door salesman or somebody at a carnival. All these brilliant phrases from not even modern advertising parlance, it's 40s and 50s advertising parlance. I never enjoyed reading in school until I got out of school, and then I, you know, then I really, you know, started hanging out in used bookstores and stuff, you know. What, what kind of things do you read? Uh, you know, I like, uh, you know, I like detective novels and stuff. the prostitutes and the pimps and the different odd characters who inhabit all these songs and the world that Tom Waits has created. There's a sort of tenderness, but there's a slight um, edginess and a danger as well at the same time. Costello was the champion, the St. Moritz Hotel, the best inside of Fairfax, reliable sources tell. Now his reputation is at large. He's down at Ben Frank's every day, drinking coffee, waiting for the one that got away. He's got such a flair for theatrical, with his love of cinema and this love of noir, and he has fun with the whole thing. You win some, you lose some. You're searching for something, and you're fearless and willing to experiment. Sometimes you find yourself going back in time just to locate something that you can't find in the future. You know, you're trying to discover that which has been overlooked by moving forward. Well, this is all about a small little town in Northern California. All about a hot summer night. As the trucks roll by of about a foster freeze. A song like Burma Shave really has got a sense of the Badlands about it. It's a doomed relationship. You know, it's a couple and the lamb. It's a beautiful narrative. And they say dreams are growing wild every night. Just this side of a little town I know called Burma Shave. Burma Shave, of course, is also an advert. It's the American dream. There's something out there that you need, you require, that will change your life for the better. You need Burma Shave. Why Burma Shave? It's very into using advertising as metaphors for the dreams that these people have and a cheap, accessible way they think of getting hold of their dreams. Send me blue valentine all the way from Philadelphia he was just a man out of time, clearly. And he knew it, I think, <laughs> obviously, and he, he played with it. The craft and young genius of someone who was coming up with lyrics that were on a par with someone like Johnny Mercer or Hoagy Carmichael or any of the songwriters that had been the backbone of the classic American songbook. That's why I'm always on the run. That's why I changed my name. The Great American Songbook is something that either gets to you or it doesn't. And it got to Tom because there was a lot of intelligence in that, in the lyrics of those songs. I would go over to my friends' houses and go into the den with their dads and find out what they were listening to. I couldn't wait to be an old man. I was about 13 now. I didn't really identify with the music of my own generation, but I seemed to like the old stuff, Cole Porter and Gershwin and Frank Sinatra. What is this thing called love? Tom had that wonderful talent to absorb all of these things this that he saw. It's like storing up paints and being able to dig out the colors you want 
when you get ready to paint a picture. Hey, this is what he does. He paints pictures. I grew up on uh, a street called Kentucky Avenue. I was born at a very young age. And, uh, when I was about five years old, I used to I used to walk down Kentucky Avenue collecting cigarette butts. And I finally got me a paper route. You know? I used to get up at one o'clock in the morning so I could deliver my papers and still have time to break the law. When I first heard that song, it broke my heart. When he talks about taking the spokes from the wheelchair of the kid he's with and putting them on his shoulders as, as if they're wings. I'll take the spokes from your wheelchair And the back by his wings And I'll tie them to your shoulders on your feet I'll steal a hacksaw from my dad And cut the braces off your legs And we'll bury them tonight Out in the cornfield What other songwriter would include the image of cutting off the braces on a, on a polio victim? We we'll slide all the way down the drain to New Orleans in the fall. The sad, sweeping, melancholy songs are probably the real Tom Waits. We get an insight into his his actual real personality. At the time that Tom was busy writing songs about L.A., if you wanted to find it, you could find some really sleazy parts of L.A. and the people that went with it. And Tom often went looking for it. Many times he went looking for it with a bottle of booze in his hand. The biggest enemy of this kind of world is the sunrise. It's like the world outside of uh, morals and normality. So the women he portrays are from that world. The album cover of Small Change depicts this, what looks to me like, you know, the backstage of a strip joint. These are people who are working, trying their best to get through life, doing what they have to do. He's not judging. Waits and all his worldly goods have been crammed into two rooms in a fairly seedy motel in Hollywood's red light district. It's ankle deep in clutter. Waits says if they clean up around him, they just might clean out his head as well. Your songs are about waitresses and bartenders and mums. Why do you celebrate these people in song? For the same reason that a lawyer hangs out in a pool room or how do you find a lot of photographers at a wedding, you know? Because I uh, find a lot of ideas here, and there's a lot of life going on around here, and, um, you know, so I'm uh, kind of a bit of a private investigator, maybe, you know? Yeah, I love you. I love you, Mario. You know, my dad spent a lot of time in the bars. My dad drank in the afternoon in really dark bars. So I was drawn to the dark places. The bar 
Firefly was something that very much seeped into Tom Waits' character. So he became the crumpled suit, you know, going to bed in the suit, shaving two days before the performance. So you've got a five o'clock shadow. And he created a character that people could recognize, but he made it his own. As far as being a character in my own stories, I remain in all of the stories. Uh, but at the same time, I think the creative process is a combination of uh, imagination and uh, experience and memories and, uh, you know. So by the time the story is finished or the song is finished, uh, it may or may not resemble where the story came from. He said, I went down to Skid Row. I drank a bottle of whiskey, threw up, and wrote Tom Trobert's Blues. That's the way Tom operated. Wasted and wounded. No hate what the moon did. The God would have paid for no. Wasted and wounded. It ain't what the moon did. I got what I paid for. Um, it's it's just an incredible way to start a record. If Frank cannot borrow. He sounds completely broken in that song to me. But it's so uplifting at the same time. Every song is like a little creation of the moment. Somewhere at four o'clock in the morning, uh, in between uh, four bottles of whiskey, um, th three packs of Goloise. I'm tired of all these soldiers here. It's trying to find some truth, and the only way you can find it is to really go deep and, and, and kind of abase yourself, and then you find out what's there. To me, he is a mixture of Satchmo Armstrong and Humphrey Bogart. So would you welcome the curious and the very talented Tom Waits here. <laughs> How are you, Tom? Better than nothing. Yeah. Nice <laughs> trail. I was first going on some of the talk shows, and that's when you could smoke on TV shows, and he was smoking. At 29, you write about all of these things that happen to you, like this sort of like a low life thing that happens. You know, this song that you're going to be you doing? You read that right off the page. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. <laughs> said low life right there. Where? I was oh, just so like impressed that. with his stage persona. Because that's what it was, really. I mean, um, whether, how much of that is real, I don't know. Do you worry about achievement? Well, no, I worry about a lot of things, but I don't worry about achievement. I worry primarily about whether there are nightclubs in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> in some ways, he was not that person at all. Tom came to dinner at my house lots of times, and he was just... You know, an ordinary guy with a great sense of humor and the gruff voice. I have a little hair on your chest. He's coming along then, huh? Oh, in Canada, man. Well, if he's bringing friends, then you're fucking crazy. Come on, watch your language over there. there. Watch it. Bring it down, bring it down. Cool it off. I'm writing now, I'm writing an album. Tales of Woe from Heart Attack and Vine. <laughs> it's gonna sound a little more like James Brown and the Famous Flames, that kind of feel to it. I gotta shake this old wino image, you know? This old song dealing with urban problems. Heart Attack and Vine, this mythical street corner where there's a bar or a diner. <laughs> It's the very inkiest his writing gets, and the most frightening, but it's ridiculously cool. La, la, with your pants on fire. 
White spades hanging on a telephone wire. Well, gamblers reevaluate along a dotted line. You never recognize yourself a heart attack and mine. He uses his voice as a gorgeous instrument for getting across the meaning of these lives. And, you know, the gravel in his voice is the gravel these people are having to walk along. When he sings, he goes into that completely uh, mo monstrous demon voice, like he's possessed. I'm the gravelly-voiced singer. Invariably, that's how I'm referred to gargling with uh, various uh, cleaning products, that type of thing, you know. They're trying to be funny. I'm okay with that. My wife said, I've never really listened to him because he scares me, you know. Uh, and I said, what if I quote the lyrics while the song's on? And now she's a huge fan because she loves great words. You know there ain't no devil, it's just God when he's drunk. It's fantastic, it's the duality of man, it's the duplicity of the character in the song, and it's also, we're all capable of being great, we're all capable of being truly awful. It was kind of a step backwards for me a little bit, as I had already tried to break out of my mortuary piano and cocktail hairdos and that whole obsession with liquor and my own you know, perverted enjoyment of all that. He said, I was sitting there playing the piano last night and there was a knock on the door and the prettiest girl came in. And she said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm writing songs for one from the heart, for Francis. And that was the beginning of that romance. And how did you meet this guy in there? Accidentally. Where? <laughs> Actually, I was a nun, and he fell asleep in the church, and I woke him up. <laughs> now, that's not true. It depends. No, uh, we were both. I was working for Coppola Studios, Zoetrope Studios. And and did you you saw him perform musically? Um, Several times, presumably? And never, never, never. Had no idea who or what he was. And in fact, he frightened me. <laughs> <laughs> Tom was leading a very on-the-edge life. And Kathleen saved his life because she got him to stop drinking. I'm the other half of what I consider to be a really great songwriting team. She has dreams like Hieronymus Bosch. She writes more from her dreams, I write more from the world or from the newspaper, and uh, somehow it all works together. Swordfish trombone, what the hell is that? Is it a trombone with a swordfish attached? I've got absolutely no idea, but it gives you an image. It's gonna be sharp, edgy, brassy, and strange, and it's gonna, it's gonna really screw up your head for a while. When you don't realize where it comes in the lineage, swordfish trombones is even more spectacular. If you just heard it and didn't know anything else about what had happened before with Tom Waits' music, you'd know it was a great record, but that it came out of nowhere 
in the way that it does. It's so inventive. It's complete artistic reinvention. He sort of went from black and white film noir to kind of some completely garish technicolor. You know, he's having a lot of fun with this, this ragtag band that sound like they're only just holding it together. And these almost stream of consciousness lyrics and the howling, the howling blues voice. The influence of Kathleen's wife, she was a story analyst and screenwriter, brings a real kind of cinematic quality to his music. There's something very theatrical about the, his instrumentation. She changed the way I hear music. It made me more rhythmic, more fearless, more percussive. The idea of make your own instruments. You don't have to play that if you don't like that. Make one yourself. Make one that sounds better. on from talking about everyday life and blue collar nightlife to absolute sort of madness and dementia in a way. He sees the beauty in the freakish and the outcasts and the outsiders. Suddenly on Soulfish trombones, within individual songs, he's jumping from a kind of uh, an escape criminal. But then suddenly he's a leprechaun. Okay, Tom. <laughs> Some of the stuff's a little more exotic. I used a uh, banjo, accordion, bass marimba, African squeeze drum, calliope, uh, harmonium. One of the problems a lot of musicians have is, is that their hands can get very used to playing um, certain instruments. So you're no longer kind of necessarily feeling, you're actually observing your hands doing this. Tom Waits became very aware of this and with Swordfish Trombones, he actually said, I want to move away from that. And he started playing unusual instruments. He started to try to rediscover his spirit. Harry Parch was a composer. He used to make his own instruments. These instruments were amazing looking. They looked like outer space sculptures. And you can see how something like that would appeal to Tom Waits. In Shore Leave, you can hear a chair being dragged across the floor as an instrument, you know? and. That's pretty amazing that he did that. He probably heard it and go, hey, let's put that in the song. Eight o'clock. Show's about to start. Come on in. Sure Leave is a song. He's another one of those tied neatly with a bow. You have a character, you have a situation. He tells you exactly what you, you need to hear, right down to the tiniest detail. I think I could probably recite the whole song from the top. Uh, do you want me to have a go? With bloodshot eyes and a purple heart, uh, I rolled down the National Stroll. I've jumped a lot, I have, haven't I? With bloodshot eyes and a purple heart. With a bloodshot eyes and a purple heart. I just rolled down the National Stroll. I worked at a, a restaurant in a sailor town for a long time in National City. It was next to a tattoo parlor and a uh, country western. Uh, Dance hall. And I sat down and wrote a letter to my wife. I said, baby, I'm so far away from home. And then it gets towards the end, and he says, I wondered how the moon that shines down over this Chinatown fair could look down on Illinois and find you there. And I wondered how the same moon outside. With this Chinatown fair, the 
An aching bit of classic Waitsian romance at the end of this sort of portrait of uh, a sailor on his shore leave. I feel that Rain Dogs was probably very much influenced by Tom and Kathleen and their kids living in New York City. New York is so concentrated, it's like in your face. <laughs> Had to be a huge influence on him, just just being there. In direct experience of anyone walking down the street in New York, you hear a lot of influences of different cultures simultaneously. America is like the melting pot, but in Waits's work, it works more like a juxtaposition. I went to a rehearsal uh, building on Times Square in New York, and you could hear every kind of music coming to you through the walls and through the windows and underneath the door. You heard African bands and you heard like uh, you know comedians, and uh, you know, I think I just like the whole uh, melange of it. You know, it all kind of mixes together. I like hearing things incorrectly. I think that's that's. How I get a lot of ideas is by mishearing something. I was just messing around. We were just jamming, and I just stuck the alto and tenor in my mouth and playing it. He walked in the room and he goes, What are you doing? What is that? What are you doing? Like, I don't know, just messing around. Let's use that. Well, I ain't going back to Detroit, and that's for damn sure. You are not the only innocent asshole in here. I was set up too. All of his cinematic work, down by Law, Rumblefish, um, you know, all of these films, he's kind of, he's always come across as an outsider. Shadow, you're my man. What the fuck you doing out here in the garbage? Just leave me alone, Preston. You're a bad man. He's a brilliant actor. He's a brilliant performer. I think there's some people who think Tom was a fake because he's a great actor. But a great actor is not necessarily a fake. Yeah, sure. It helped me get outside myself a little bit and it helped me uh, shape shift a little bit or uh, take on the persona of, of someone other than myself. Even though you say I, you know, you're not necessarily the I in your song. And when you sing a song, you are kind of like acting, you know. I started playing with Tom, not only was he doing the more avant-garde stuff, but he was also getting into European stuff like Germany. I you know, you know, those kind of those kind of tunes which no one else was doing. Kurt Vile, Three Penny Opera, and those things were a huge influence at that time for him. Somebody told me, hey, you know, you sound like this guy, Kurt Vile. So I, I was thinking I was kind of moving in that direction without uh, knowing how or why. And uh, he took melodies that were very alluring 
and he said things very disturbing inside of them. And I think I'm drawn to that. All right, I'm a red dog. He was always a showman, but now he was sort of saying it's vaudeville. And I'm going to dress up like a kind of, almost like a vaudeville performer, and I'm going to be entertaining you with bleak songs, but in some cases done in quite a jaunty style. He loves to crawl into kind of wicked, clown-esque personalities and express through that something uh, very urgent and strong that almost I find he would be too shy to do as himself. So I think the role playing for him is definitely a way of being able to express himself more extremely than he would dare as Tom Waits. Welcome to Miss Kiko's Chi Chi Club. It's showtime. Blow him up. Wherever you may go. Put on your overcoat. Take me away. If I started dressing up and singing in different voices and pretending I was from different centuries, I'd get kicked out of my band for a start. You know? But to Tom Waits, that's all he's ever done. This mid-period Tom Waits is much more stylized. There's much more artifice. He's clearly saying all this contrivance is to an end. This is a whole aesthetic and that this is essential to the way I make music. One of the things that connects me and Tom so closely is the circus and the freak shows were my childhood. <laughs> the carnival was always, you, know, you could descend into hell and come out. used office furniture out there on San Fernando Road and assumed a $30,000 loan at 15 and a quarter percent, put a down payment on a little two-bedroom place. He just kind of found a way of introducing his whole kind of concept of storytelling. Most of the time, a little chihuahua named Carlos that had some kind of... People said it's connected to his, you know, his, his relationship with his dad, with, with his dad Frank. One night, Frank was on his way home from work. He stopped at the liquor store picked up a couple of Mickey's Big Mouths, drank them in the car on way to the Shell station. He got a gallon of gas in a can. Drove home, doused everything in the house, and torched it. <clears throat> Parked across the street laughing, watching it burn. All Halloween orange and chimney red. And Frank put on a top 40 station. Got on the Hollywood freeway, headed north. Never could stand that dog. The American dream is to have lots of money and to be a success. And you don't get many songs about people who've got lots of money and are a success in Tom Waits' songs. They're desperados. Charles Bukowski had a story that uh, essentially was saying that it's the little things that drive men mad. It's the broken shoelace when there's no time left that sends men completely out of their mind. And, uh, so this is kind of in that spirit. And um, I think there's a little bit of Frank in everybody. a spirit, whether it's a spirit of desperation or a spirit of determined self-delusion. 
there's still, to all these characters, a sort of fractured, broken nobility to their indignity, to their unseemly demises. Oh, you're beautiful. No, no, I know, I know. You hear that all the time, you know. You are Frank's Wildies is my favourite. I love this Frank Sinatra character. You know, roll over big town. So there's only one place to go. I'm going straight up to the top. Oh, yeah. He plays with the uh, arrangement of those things, not unlike Charles Mingus, where he brings in these slightly jarring tonalities that take what sounds like a swinging early 60s kind of lounge number and turns it into a disorientating kind of swirl of sounds that evokes a descent into some sort of moral dissolution. Someone made me that way. He was just trying to go for not making it straight. It's just slightly warped. I mean, that's the thing I was able to add because I, I'm kind of warped myself. So, <laughs> but that was an unspoken word. He didn't have to say it. Where the air is. It's images of desolation and hopelessness. And by the end of it, he's broken and on his knees and it's all gone terribly wrong. When you walk with Jesus, he's gonna save your soul. You got to keep the devil. Why we gotta keep him down in the hole? They're just such great stories. The subculture or underbelly of life that Tom Waits goes into screaming dramatic. Hellfire Brimstone Preacher. Praise I don't know what it is. Two dollars. His carnival sideshow man is not that different to his whiskey preacher. Matches your faith. Frank's Wild Years, that record was actually it was like the huckster preacher. It was a lot about hucksters, you know? Fakes, you know? But that's where he was coming from. Blast him out. People can't get an amen. Whether Tom Waits is trying to convince us that he believes that he's going to help if he doesn't be careful, or whether there's a part of him that actually fears it in that performance, there's a fragility and, and, a, and a scaredness to it. There are a lot of preachers in my family, preachers and teachers. And my family was a little disappointed when they found out I was going to be neither. You know, they were a little like, oh, man, well, we aren't going to be able to help you then. By the time Waits gets to Bone Machine, you just think of that as a title, Bone Machine. I mean, it's, what is it? It's human beings or animals. It's life, but stripped to its absolute bare minimum. It kind of takes away everything we think of as being human. There's no soul, there's no, there's no fun, there's no anything, it's just a machine. We were hanging around the same kitchen table where we'd been listening to Closing Time and Blue Valentine and all the romantic balladeering stuff. Uh, we were listening to it when Bone Machine came out and it scared us all to death. I think we perhaps listened to it all the way through once and then we're like, should we put the romantic ones back on? Mom heard the uh, title Bone Machine and she said to me, Tom, why do you always have to degrade? Because <laughs> I think after the, hearing the title, she was worried about my soul. She said, don't forget, Tom, that uh, the devil hates nothing more than a sane Christian. <laughs> so I thought it would also make a good song title. 
Tom is obsessed with death. There's always decay, the end of things, and it's all pulling him down into the earth. It feels like it's being recorded outside and using the skulls of dead animals in the middle of the woods somewhere, and um, he's gone completely insane. We all just hit a bunch of sticks in the parking lot, and I was like, man, this is just the greatest experience ever, you know? <laughs> Would you care for an old uh, Dr. Theod or Canapé? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Renfield. It's interesting that Bone Machine came out in the same year he played Renfield in, in Dracula. And I just didn't get it initially. But then when I thought about the character he was playing, you know, stuck in a, in a jail, feeling controlled, again, like a freak. The master will come. And he has promised to make me immortal. How? There's something very stylized and very circus-like and very kind of cabaret-like about the way he plays Renfield. It felt totally congruent with everything else he was doing. Tom started playing more like like country blues, I call it. It's a very like uh, kind of spooky, another Tom Waits kind of thing where you just feel you're there, you know, like, man, I can feel like I'm a guy in, you know, in the Mississippi somewhere, you know, as opposed to some really blues posers that you don't feel it at all. I think he gets to the heart and the essence of blues with Mill Variations. It's got something that really feels like it's reaching back into into time and and uh, finding something that's so different, um, you know. And 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 yet is is totally him. It's it's his identity within all that. There's definitely a Southern Gothic connection with Tom's music. Whether you grow up in San Diego, California, or Jackson, Mississippi, or whether you grow up in a ghetto or a middle-class suburb, it's all about your perception, how you view the world. I mean, that's what makes a good artist. came to doing the Imaginarium of Dr. Parnassus, and we had the devil himself. And I couldn't think of anybody better than Tom, especially because his voice. I mean, I just love that voice. To be able to talk like Tom is really a joy. Can I offer you a stick of gum or um, a breath mint? It's the theater of the thing for him. He's a grand illusionist and always has been. Damn. I've won. These are my feelings. You know, I just tried to imagine that it's a soldier riding home from any war. I mean, as soon as you're at war, you've lost. We're killing off our children. We're sending our children to war. They're sending their children to war. And he's genuinely concerned about where the world is going. I mean, he's a man who loves everything, and he knows there's damnation and doom waiting. It's a great honor to induct Tom Waits into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You know, songs. Uh, 
are really just very interesting things to be doing with the air. And uh, they say that I have no hits and I'm difficult to work with. And, and, and they say that like it's a bad thing. It's a really odd career path, the way he's done it. He wrote the simplest ballads in the most recognisable form right at the beginning, and he excelled at it. And then he starts exploring, and then he starts looking for a different voice. It's a dark vision, but it's an ennobling sort of spirit that permeates all these characters. He gives them all a, a chance to say, well, I did it my way, you know. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether he's singing about the darkest stuff happening in the world, but the actual sense of showmanship um, and the sense of theatre and the musicianship means that you can't help smiling or grinning. You've got to give in and say, I'm happy to live in Tom Waits' world. It's rather mystifying when you think about songs, where they come from, and you don't really go to songwriting school. You, you learn by listening to tunes, and then you try to understand them and take them apart and see what they're made of, and they wonder if you can make one, too. I can't get into his brain, but I'm just glad I was part of it, just to be in the room with all that stuff. Looks like the press conference is about to begin. <laughs> He's a complete outsider, and he uh, was uh, faithful to himself. Calm down, calm down, hold your horses, man. The more he delves into himself as an artist, the less he cares what other people think. And when we're all lost, what do we do? We look up to the night sky. If you're going to go after who is Tom Waits within all these characters that he conjures for us, he's all of them. Are there any more questions? I want to know what he's going to do next, is all I want to know. <laughs> What's he doing in there? <laughs> come on, Tom, come out. Don't go into that barn, Tom. Say hi to your mother.